It was a week or so before Christmas, and so much snow covered everything that the landscape seemed unimaginable without it. I was plotting my escape from a reform school program run mostly by Mormons in rural Montana. The last time someone ran away, it was summer. Two girls had broken into the kitchen one night, stole the butcher knives, and ventured into the woods. It wasn't until morning when the entire place went into a frenzy after the kitchen staff noticed the biggest knives missing and the girls were found and brought back by breakfast. We were forbidden possession of anything that could potentially aid an escape. No bags, backpacks, or purses of any kind, no personal food, and obviously no weapons or anything that could be used for physical harm. My Nalgene water bottle, a thin long sleeve shirt I knotted up and fashioned into a satchel, and a digital watch were my most prized possessions. All the other kids were issued Carhartt work pants to wear over thermals while doing the manual labor we were forced to do in big groups. This included mostly clearing the land, tending to the random farm animals, and most common this time of year, breaking ice and shoveling snow. I was still considered new and not trusted to be outside for long periods of time, so I only had the thin brown pants we wore for indoor activities. As a newcomer, I was allowed to speak with only 12 to 15 of the oldest kids there, most of whom were about to turn 18 and be free unless under court order. Getting caught even just looking at another newbie the wrong way could result in punishment and lost privileges. This made it impossible for me to develop any sort of connection with anyone, since the people I could interact with all seemed so far gone. These kids' mindsets were slightly understandable after spending their last formative years of being a minor confined to a small plot of land, but I just saw it as Stockholm Syndrome. The place I was sent to was part of a trend of the growing youth res residential treatment industry that parents or the state could force teens to attend for a variety of issues. I did not know this at the time, but the program I was at was modeled after an anti-drug cult called Synanon, which ex existed in the 1950s. It followed Synanon's treatment approach of breaking its members by using isolation, humiliation, hard labor, and sleep deprivation as tactics. We were forced to participate in something called primal scream therapy, a practice where one recalls and reenacts how they were in a past traumatic experience with spontaneous, unrestrained emotion. I sat through session after session of staff members bullying kids in order to try to get them into their feelings. It wasn't uncommon for kids to shriek themselves into fainting once these adults got under their skin. I'll never forget the bloodshot eyeballs of the pretty blonde girl who screamed so much she popped blood vessels after a, smap, after a male staff member impersonated her rapist. Self-policing was the norm, with older kids being put in charge of the new kids and creating a culture of fear no matter who you were around. Snitching was rewarded, and there wasn't even the faintest ripple of rebellion, even in my desperately searching eyes. I realized this jumping on what I thought was a prime opportunity for acquiring an accomplice in my escape. I secretly passed a note to a perpetually looking sad girl who had been screaming about how much she fucking hated high school earlier that day. I discovered my invitation to run was brutally turned down by my assignment to excavate a frozen stump three feet in diameter from the earth the next day. My mind was set on life outside of that place and my mode, motivation extended way beyond my own life. I lived and breathed to see my twin sister again. Institutionalization will kill a part of anyone's soul, but I experienced loss in an entirely different dimension. My sister and I were forcefully separated and I had no idea where she was. Glancing in the bathroom mirror and seeing her peering back at me with lost eyes was enough to choke me up. She was the main topic when it was my turn to get roasted in those therapy sessions. Your sister's happy without you. She doesn't want you corrupting her anymore. They would yell at me. It took everything in me to stay stoic, but the notion that this might be true made me sick to my stomach. I was diagnosed with ODD, or Oppositional Defiance Disorder, and was pegged as the evil twin, thus legitimizing their belief that my relationship with my sister was unhealthy and destructive. While other kids around me were dealing with actual substance addiction, molestation, bestiality, and suicidal feelings, among other issues, I had a hard time not thinking they, thinking they just needed a reason to talk down to me. At the program, I was experiencing for the first time what it was like living day to day as, as a singleton. There was a new quietness in my head where my sister was once a part of my inner dialogue, and the void I felt was tremendous. 
My twin and I were head over heels in love with each other from before day one, a love our family fostered almost too well. Avon and I were six weeks premature and kept together in an incubator separate from our mother for a week when we were first born. We are constantly referred to in singular as the girls by everyone. Being twins was the backbone of our identities and the world reinforced that. Realizing our power together and considering ourselves too smart for our own good as we got older, we decided high school wasn't for us and dropped out of the ninth grade with a plan to get our GEDs. Our parents were furious about this decision and saw the situation in a very black and white manner. Go back to high school or they would get the authorities involved. We scoffed at their concern that we'd end up on the streets. We were a team in what we considered our pursuit of happiness, and if anyone or anything undermined that, we didn't let them in our world. We moved out and planned to find work and prepare for the GED. Shortly thereafter, we were tricked and kidnapped by four men who worked as transporters for bad kids during what we thought was going to be a pleasant visit with mom. At that moment, we became the custody of the state and was my parents' sorry, naive attempt to lay a heavy hand down on their truant daughters. I didn't know it would be the last time I'd see my sister for half a year. That night, I escaped from my program. I had set my watch for 2 a.m. It may sound like I had some carefully devised plan of action brewing for weeks, but my approach was more balls out than anything. Before bed that night, I remember looking up at the stars and realizing it was the right night to leave because it was perfectly clear out. When the beep of my watch went off, I laid in my bunk, making sure no one else in the room had woken up from the muffled noise. I fumbled in the dark room, piecing together a makeshift snowsuit. And when I was done, only the thermals I wore to bed and my boots were the things I knew for sure were mine. I left the dorm as quiet as a mouse with only the sound of my heart thumping so loud, I actually wondered if it was audible to the other sleeping girls. Once I climbed through the haphazardly constructed electric fence, that marked the property line in the woods. I was on a dirty snow-covered road. I had convinced myself this entire ordeal was possible because I carefully studied the road on the drive-in. If I remembered correctly, this single barren road would take me to the first town, which wasn't too far. Turns out a confused, frightened girl in a car with no idea where she was, was being taken doesn't track distance very well because it was actually pretty far. Walking down that road under the billions of stars, the silence was deafening. The moon reflected so brightly onto the white-covered landscape, giving an entirely new definition to what I previously considered moonlight. I was doing a sort of power walk jog, stopping every eight minutes or so just to be still and listen. The swish sound of my Carhartt pants and crunch of my boots on the snow was so painfully loud that stopping seemed necessary to be able to take in my surroundings and to provide even just an inkling of safety. When I, what I was listening for, I don't know, but it just gave me a better sense of myself in the moment. Losing my sense of time and how far I had gone, I began to shut down. One thing that was wildly apparent was how incredibly alone I was. It was the first time in my life that no one knew where I was, not even my twin. With this came pure, unadulterated fear, as it was the first time I had only myself to look to for direction. I kept moving forward. At some point in the midst of cruising by the endless banks of snow and coniferous trees, I felt warmth on my thighs, urine. I was peeing myself uncontrollably as I walked. Stopping to question what that sensation was and then realizing it brought me back to reality. It comforted me to have this bodily function happening when everything else felt as if it had gone up in flames. I kept moving after that, and eventually the sun started rising, and I'd reached the town I remember driving through on the way to the program. I was greeted by staff members at a gas station sent to escort me back to the program after I had asked the first person I saw for a ride to the next town. So he wasn't warming up the car. I realized about the deceptive stranger his staff members surrounded me. Being a 16-year-old in the clothes issued by the school up the road, in a town with a population of 500 was a dead giveaway, apparently. That night, I walked 11 and a half miles through the snow for seven hours straight before I reached any sort of civilization. I was disappointed that I had failed, but my thoughts were too busy getting to know the strange girl within me who had bared her fangs in the face of what she wanted and went for it alone. This was just the beginning. Even after that, I didn't see or hear from my sister 
for another four and a half months. My sister was in a similar program in Utah the entire time. She had attempted escape and failed once, just like me. We later would both choose the week of our 17th birthday without knowing it to attempt to leave our respective programs again, and we'd both be successful. We secretly reunited with the help of trusted friends on a serene private piece of land in Northern California. When I saw my sister, she had been there for about a week already and had no idea I was coming. Pulling up the gravel driveway, she looked older and dirty from living on the land and spending most of her time outdoors. The tan and dust that settled on her skin was like a manifestation of the wear and tear from the past six months. What happened to her? I screamed in my head. She dropped the ax she was chopping fire, firewood with, and we ran towards one another in a synchronized chorus of gasps and cries. I went... I once again felt the warm hug of the body that I was born hugging. It was not my sister and I's forced separation that made me independent for the first time, but my choice to rebel against it. Give it up for Leslie Johnson.